Hello there, this is the fifth of our harder circular motion questions. Uh, this is another vertical motion question, like the fourth one, but this time, rather than being an object that's being swung around on the end of a string, the circular motion here is being provided by rolling down the hemisphere. And it's this type of question that's often the one my students find the hardest to think about. Let's just have a quick look at the setup in the question. The particle starts at the top of a smooth hemisphere. It's given a push, it's given a speed, and the initial speed has some condition on it, which we're hoping is going to become relevant later on to the question. As it rolls down the sphere, it's going to start picking up speed. It's going to be going faster and faster until, at some point, where it makes an angle theta with the vertical, it's going to leave the sphere. It's going to stop going in circular motion and at that point it's going to start becoming a projectile. The only force acting on this is going to be gravity. We have been asked, in part A of this question, to find an expression which relates the angle at which it leaves the sphere, or leaves the surface of the sphere, to various um, variables, the initial speed, the strength of gravity, and the size of the hemisphere. And that's it, it's not given us any hints about how to do it. We need to try and figure out a plan. Now we had a similar situation in the previous example, and we ended up thinking about energy, seeing what energy would tell us about the situation looking at circular motion and generating a force diagram, seeing what that told us about the motion, and then putting it together and hoping that everything would work out. And that's going to be our general plan here as well. If we consider the energy just after it's been pushed, and then the energy after it's been rotated by a, an angle of theta, we should be able to get an expression that tells us the new velocity of the object. If we think about it, we can see that it's going to leave the sphere when the normal reaction between the sphere and the particle becomes zero. So if we consider circular motion and we set the normal reaction equal to zero, that should tell us something about when it leaves the sphere. And hopefully we'll be able to combine the first two of those to get an expression for the point at which it leaves the sphere in terms of the variables we've been given. So let's try that and see how far we can get. First of all, we're going to think about energy. And we've got a choice here. The kinetic energy is going to be a half mv squared, and we're given the initial speed, so that's fine. We've got to decide for kinetic energy, sorry, for gravitational potential energy, where we're going to set zero to be. And there are two sensible choices here. We could have the zero level being at the top of the hemisphere or at the bottom of the hemisphere. Uh, and I've chosen to make ground level zero for gravitational potential energy here. Uh, you could try and do the question where the point A had zero gravitational potential energy. Hopefully it would all work out. So at the top of the hemisphere we've got some gravitational potential energy, we've got some kinetic energy. After, we're at, uh, the, after we've rotated round for a little bit, uh, the gravitational potential energy is going to be mgh, and h here is going to be a cos theta. It's this height here from b down to the ground, or from whatever point we are, because b is supposed to represent where it actually leaves the circle. The, kin the kinetic energy is a half mv squared. It's v we want, so let's equate those. Let's rearrange and let's see what we've got. So what we end up with on the bottom line is an expression for the current velocity, v squared, given the original velocity and some of the other variables. So what we're going to hope is that if we think about circular motion, we're going to be using this in some way to try and substitute and end up getting an expression for the normal reaction. So this is going to be a very, very vital component in about a minute's time.
Right, let's see what circular motion tells us. As we've said several times now, the real key to doing circular motion calculations is to draw a force diagram. There aren't very many forces here. There's gravity pulling the particle downwards, and there's the normal reaction pushing it outwards. We've got an acceleration due to circular motion, which is v squared over r. And now we just need to um, create an equation of motion. Let's use Newton's second law, resolving from the particle towards the centre of the hemisphere. So we've got the component of gravity pushing you towards the centre. We've got all of the normal reaction pushing you away from the centre, and that's got to equal mass times acceleration. So what we get there is an expression for the normal reaction. And we want to try and figure out the point B, and the point B is where it leaves the sphere. It's going to leave the sphere when the reaction becomes zero. You can't have a normal reaction of less than zero. It's not sucking you into the sphere. So what we need to do now is set the normal reaction equal to zero and see what expression we get. And very nicely, what happens there is we actually get an expression for how fast it's going when it leaves the sphere. Because when we equate everything, all the m's cancel out, and we end up that the speed it's going when it leaves the sphere is ga cos theta. So at this point we need to think about the two different expressions for v squared we've got, and what happens when we equate them. From the first part, we have this general expression for the velocity when you've rotated round a um, particular angle. From the second part, we've got this expression for how fast it's going when it leaves the sphere. So if we equate these, multiply out and rearrange, we should hopefully be able to get an expression for cos theta. It's certainly in both of those. Let's see what happens. Multiply out, rearrange, divide everything by 3GA, and we get this really nice formula here, this really nice expression. It's telling us that cos theta is u squared plus 2GA divided by 3GA. Now I'm really happy with that as a, um, as a formula for several reasons. There's the, I think, just looking at that, that's going to be the correct formula. One reason is there is a really, really standard example that I know I did with my class when I taught this, which is to consider what happens when you just touch the particle that's at the top. So it starts off with an initial velocity of zero. And when you do that, you find that uh, the angle where the particle leaves the sphere is two-thirds. And you can see there that if you set u squared equal to zero, you do indeed get cos theta equals two-thirds, so that, that's good. And that's the first of my notes here. Um, the other reason which makes me confident that this is the correct formula that we should be getting is um, in the question we had a condition for the initial velocity. The initial velocity needs to be less than the square root of ag. And if we look at the formula for cosine, we know that the maximum possible value of cosine is 1, and that maximum possible value would happen when u squared is equal to ga, because then we'd have 3ga divided by 3ga. So there's two confirmations here that make us comfortable that we have actually got the correct solution. There's one from prior experience, prior examples we've looked at in lessons, and there's one from the question itself. So now we have that formula, the second part of the question asks us to use it. We're told that the particle hits the horizontal surface with a certain speed, we've got to work backwards and find the angle at which it left the hemisphere. Now we're going to do that by figuring out how fast it was pushed back at point A. And we can do this fairly easily. We don't have to do any nasty projectile stuff. We just have to think about energy. 
we've been given the speed when it hits the surface, so we can work out its kinetic energy. We should be able to then work backwards to figure out um, how fast it was going at the top, and then use our result for cosine to figure out the angle. Let's see what happens if we do that. We already know from the first part what the kinetic energy is at the top of the hemisphere. At the bottom there is no gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy based on the information in the question. If we equate those two energies we get that expression for the initial velocity. It's just a half ga. So we should now be able to plug a half ga into the formula for cos theta, take the inverse of cosine and we'll get the angle. It turns out very nicely, it turns out that the cosine of the angle is just 5 over 6, which gives you an angle of a little less than 34 degrees. If we look at the solution as a whole, there are several points worth noticing there. The first is that we weren't actually told the individual steps to go from the question to the answer. The question here gave us the goal it wanted and it was up to us to consider exactly what individual little calculations to do to get there. It took it about a page of working to get the answer it wanted. Despite that, in the end it's really not too bad. Circular motion problems will almost always involve a v squared over r or an omega squared r and, in vertical circular motion questions, energy. So even if we had no idea what we were going to do, the two sensible things to do, which is let's figure out what energy tells us and what circular motion tells us, would actually get us most of the way to the correct answer. The third point in my summary is reiterating something I'm going on a bit now, which is you really do need to explain to someone who's reading your working how you're going from one part of the question to the other. If you'd written this down without any English, if we'd just written the algebra, it would look like a real mess, particularly because we have to connect different parts of the answer together. And the last point there is that uh, at this level, at further maths, we really do need to be confident in our algebraic manipulation. There are very, very few numbers in this question. There is an awful lot of algebra. We have to be comfortable with manipulating expressions and equations, solving simultaneous equations, even when everything is very algebraic. And remember, this is going to happen in quite a high-pressure exam situation. It's really worthwhile making sure you can do all this comfortably and confidently before you ever step close to an exam room. Overall, though, that didn't turn out too badly, and we came out with quite a nice result. Thank you.